Hilary Kelvert, who actually does come from Dunedin. Hilary, welcome to the show this afternoon. I was actually just looking. Oh, you would have heard those two comments about Dunedin students and things like that and um, uh, yeah. tertiary students. But I was actually looking at the last election in Dunedin and uh, what the result was. And David Scott won with 24,000 votes. Michael Woodhouse was second with 8,000. So that's a big gap, 24 to 8. And then a man that you will know by the name of Jack Mackey Brazil from the Green Party, he got 7,000 votes. So, yeah, almost 75%, three quarters of the votes um, at the last election went both Labour and to the Greens. Now, the reason I'm asking, so I mean, we can talk about that, but the reason I'm raising that is because Jack Mackey Brazil, Green Party candidate at the 2020 election, perennial community green activist got shot uh, about a year ago. And I'm not aware of him, anybody being arrested for his shooting, are you? No. No, I don't um, have no idea about what what in, any of, the, of, of that came to. No, it, it, no one's been arrested. <coughs> He was shot Mind you, in the company the of another man. He was, what, he was shot in the company of another man. Now, I'm not suggesting anything improper or um, at all here, I just just so you know, and also I know what the defamation laws are like. And I'm not suggesting it. But he was shot by another man that he knew. Well, presumably he knew. The police have arrested nobody. And yet there's an ongoing well, investigation. I think, I think you'll find that, that the courts have just fallen over, Michael. You might have turned your back on it, but the courts are taking forever to do nothing, really. When I say nothing, that's not fair. Um, but they didn't even but, arrest somebody, though, did they? I mean, it hasn't even got to court. No, but how long did the um, these Christchurch little scumbag men who were drugging women and things... Oh, yes, the Mother Hooch um, case. Take? Mm. And what's more troubling... And it happened in Britain with that woman who was killing babies too. Um, yes, Lucy The Lincoln. time it took after the first complaints to actually really look into it. Yep. You know, the police response to complaints appeared mm. to be, oh, yeah, well, we haven't heard from anybody else much. Or mm. surely not, surely not them or whatever. Yeah. And it takes a lot of complaints or a lot of whatever to even get them going to have a look at it it would seem and that's presumably there they would say they're underfunded and they haven't got enough time and whatever but it's just an area the whole court system is sort of falling under the weight of what of i don't know what really well actually it's funny you should say working. that because yesterday when the government announced um four billion dollars worth of cuts which really isn't four billion it's four billion over four years it's a it's really a billion and it's really half a billion but it, it looked at, it took one or two percent out of the police and courts as well and i thought to myself yeah there's some places that you could well argue like the ministry of education for example where they've got far too many policy staff and probably the ministry of the environment as well but I would have thought in the courts and the police area, if they're going to take out one or two percent, um, that's not going to make things better, is it? Well, you can't tell because, um, mm. with, for instance, councils, they um, you'd think they're often, especially the regional areas, they're regulatory authorities and things. So they're like, you want them resourced properly because they're doing regulatory things and they've got a time frame within which to do them. However... That doesn't mean that you want 30% more of them by tomorrow morning or that they, they're getting any anything done because they've got 30% more of them. You don't know what the people who are working for them are doing. Mm. You have a look, at your heart falls if you have a look what the people in Let's Get Wellington moving. Have a wee look at their job descriptions and aren't they being paid on an average of 137000 a year or something? I think they're the best paid civil servants in New Zealand, as I, I think I read the news story yeah. says. Mm -hmm. But have a look at their job descriptions. Mm. Not one of them appears to be like a typist or, a, or doing anything. And considering typists would be what you do, because all that's coming out of it is reports and paperwork. There's no real stuff coming out of it. Yes, nobody's digging up um, any roads, are they? So... 
No, I don't seem to be doing anything much. Um, but the job descriptions, just... Um, and you could say, if it was working properly, if it was doing what you imagine a vision of it might have been, to have a tripartite idea of getting Wellington going, those jobs might have been real. They might have been good jobs. But in point of fact, they're not. So it may be that if you take some money out of the courts and police, it was the money that was going to officers trying to make sure that um, gender neutral um, people have good toilets and whatever it is or, you know, you don't know. When they say frontline people, you don't even know what they are. You don't see police much except on the news when a bad thing happens. No, and then suddenly there's 50 police staff on some sort of homicide when they've already arrested the person and you wonder what the hell's going on. I've always yeah. worried about the overcommitment of resources. Yeah, um, no, 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 it's a fair point you'll make because the general point you're making is what do people do? And, and what you're saying to me is if you are an elected politician, whether you are the Minister of Education, the Prime Minister or just some sort of minor regional or district council, you don't have a clue. No, and that's why I liked that, uh, was it the Honourable Michael Bassett or somebody who said that he, when he was a minister, every Monday morning met with his chief executive or chief executives or whatever and went over what they're doing this week and what their problems are and mm. what was going on. Mm. So he not only kept an eye on what was going on, but he did you feel, have some idea of what they were doing. And if somebody had come to him and said, you need to reduce, you know, we just can't afford as many people as you have, you get the feeling that within the next couple of days he'd have a plan about which ones were more surplus to requirements than others and, and that, that he had a good working relationship with the people who were working for him. Yes, um, but here's the issue for me. The public sector in this country has increased by 15%, <coughs> all right? So we've got 16% more central government staff than we had five years ago, and we've got 13% more local government staff. Okay. Tell and me. how much more con c contractors? Well, and then you've got contractors and consultants and stuff like that. Here's the question, and it is a good question. What are they doing? Where is the proof that increasing the number of local or central government people has improved services in this country? Let's just have a yeah. quick look at them. Education. Are our education statistics going in the right way in the direction of the last five years? No. Exactly the reverse. Are our health services going in the right direction in the last five years? No. Exactly the reverse. Um, have environmental standards improved in this country over the last five years? No. No discernible improvement there. All right. Have our economic performance increased in the last five years? No, going the other way. So Please? just putting all those things together, what are all those extra civil servants doing if there is the result? And the interesting thing to me is that, because I've been thinking about that for a while, that a couple of weeks ago, the government was concentrating on, I've put 47% more into the health budget or education or something, in the last five years, aren't we doing well? And I was thinking, yeah, but where's the money gone? We've got no idea. And now that they're opening the books and they haven't got enough money, they're also saying that other lot, if they get in, the services will reduce. We have put all this extra resource in. Those other lot are going to reduce the services so you won't get what you think you do. So don't let them reduce taxes. Don't vote for them. Now, all of a sudden, they wake up this morning and they say, we're going to reduce the money mm. that we give to our departments. Mm. Now, if it was true a fortnight ago that you needed all that money because it was providing services and they had provided all these extra services, mm. then how come now you don't need it? Exactly the point I, mean, I made. I mean, so yeah. if you... Uh, if you didn't need, if you don't need these people, and it's not going to affect any frontline services, that was the what the prime minister said yesterday. No frontline services will be affected by this. Well, if that's the case, yeah. How did they end up in a job in the first place? 
Yeah. But that was, it's only been a week or so since they were saying it will, any less resources will reduce services, mm. which was basically so stupid that probably nobody listened to them. But um, I'd like to talk a bit about the Greens, because Greens, it's interesting to see the Greens and ACT, who are playing a slightly different game. Probably I don't expect to be in power and act, which sort of might well be. But David Seymour's doing, I think, quite a good routine in saying, this is our sense of direction. This is what we would like to do if we form a government. That sorts of words a wee bit stronger than that. That sort of words. But, and sometimes... Hillary, I'm going to flick well, you I'm back because um, you're breaking up there. So I'm going to put you back to um, Josh and hopefully we can get a better line because we're starting to get every second word. Well, Josh works out Hillary. You're working out Hillary, Josh? Yeah? Cool. Um, can I tell you that stats that I just quoted to you did not come from me. So it didn't come out of my bottom. All right. The stats that I quoted to you regarding the composition of the public sector in this country and public sector employees um, has been published by uh, well, Takawa Batahu. Yes, Takawa Batahu. That is this, now it's, its new name. It used to be known as the Public Service Commission and, and little, mm, yeah, I know. It's just, it does my head in, but there you go. Taikawa Mataho is the new Maori name. Well, it's the new name for the Public Service Commission. Uh, but anyhow, just um, those, so I didn't make up those stats. They didn't come out of my bottom. They actually come out of uh, the official government um, register or of, of public service employees. And they say that over the last five years, the overall public sector workforce increased by 15.3%, central government up 16%, local government up 13%. This compares with a 9% growth in the private sector over the same period. That should worry you, those stats. Hillary, have we got you better? Can we? Yeah. Are we sounding yes, better? Yes, I think you have. Oh, yep. cool. Yeah, yeah. You're not it breaking. Was a, it was a Wi-Fi connection, I think. Um, so here was, as I say, the difference between ACT and the Greens, partly because one looks like it thinks it might get in and one doesn't. Um, but David Seymour saying, giving a sense of direction on what he believes in and what they believe in and whatever. The Greens, however, has got even um, weirder than usual. And they're just saying things like, doesn't everybody like a train? If you vote for us, we'll put trains all over New Zealand. Well, not all, not all over the South Island, of course, because that doesn't count much, but we'll put trains out there. How can you not like a train? And really, they know that they can't do anything if they get in, except if what Labor does. So people can vote for Greens because they're not happy with Labor, knowing that instead of being ineffectual as a junior partner, they're going to com be completely in opposition. But it's just to tell, presumably, the, a vote for the Greens is to tell the Greens that we like you to say, don't we like trains? And we also don't like Labour at the moment. So it's, I don't know what you think. So what you're saying, it's the, it's the, the New Greens. Zealand First argument as well, because New Zealand First do that too. They're coming up with a whole series of policies that sound good, aiming to get for votes, but you know as well as I do, and so do they when they put them out, that they've even got a blind show of ever happening. So it's basically yeah. they're lying. Yeah. And on the other hand, um, I've just been having a vigorous conversation with somebody about the Nats lying because they said, oh, the Nats are lying, they're going to do, they say they're going to do this, that and the other thing and like repeal all this stuff and I'm thinking resource management wise and things. Although they say they're going to repeal it, they'll replace it with something that has a lot of similarity because all the work's been done but is missing the crucial bits that we don't like about the current government. Um, so they look like they might be saying they're doing something that they're not going to. More concerning in some respects is that it'll be hard for the Nats to do what they would like to do because so many of the government departments and things are in complete um, chaos 
of some description. I didn't want to use that word particularly, but there, nothing's working at the moment. And it's going to be, it'll take a while for this um, ship to turn around, really. Um, well, I was just being, before you, I was, had Elwyn Paul um, in the last hour talking about the state of education in this country and then, you know, making some international comparisons and things like that. I think I came to the conclusion at the end of that conversation that change is impossible Be and how depressing that really is. So, you see, and, and I get a sense of that for many things now, um, is how radical are uh, ACT and national, particularly national, prepared to get if they win election? Because they're going to have to if they want to affect change, aren't they? Yeah, well, I think it depends what you mean by change. Uh, I think on the one hand, it's even more depressing than you think because you can achieve change if it's bad enough. You can get in the way of people um, earning money for our country or whatever it is. You can stop <coughs> good things happening fairly easily. So change is possible in a negative sense. But change is proper possible in the sense of direction um, sense that if we're short of resources and things, if we, for instance, woke up in the morning and decided to um, have Maori seats the way we have them in Parliament on local bodies, and if you wanted them on other boards and things, knock your heart, knock yourself out, and then said, and we're going to not resource any of the rest of the talk to Maori stuff, they can just talk to us the same as everybody else consults with us and things. That would make things work a lot more efficiently. That would be a change in where it's going at the moment and it would make a difference. So that is a change that is quite possible. Mm. Oh, it's very interesting to raise that issue too. because John Tamahiri, the Te Māori, Māori Party president, uh, has come out um, and made an interesting point. His point in essence, Hillary, is that uh, the policies of both National and ACT with regards to Māori wards, you know, and local government, for example, um, he's, he's making the point, John Tamahiri, that they are part of treaty obligations. Now, nothing to do with special privileges. That is what you have to do if you want to acknowledge the role of Māori uh, under Te Tiriti o Waitangi. Um, so that argument is going to still be current after the election, isn't it? Because at what point yeah, but, does John Tami... Yeah, but what point does John Tami Harry go to the Supreme Court or the Court of Appeal in this country and seek to have if, that struck down by yeah, using if, treaty if, rights? Yeah. I think... Uh, I've been thinking a lot about treaty rights. I don't think they're what they look like and I think we should all be talking about them. But if you had a right to something that was a proportional seat based something then that's an alternative to what we've got now and we certainly don't have a right to uh, Maori appointing their people through a non-democratic process it's not it's not a go I don't think and you certainly don't have a right of Maori to say that they know what the treaty means and things and the rest of us don't if, it's a tre if we're going to base everything on the treaty, then we need to know what it means and we need to all have a discussion and we need to treat it, I think, what it means ought to be done like they do amendments in the United States. So, you know, they have the Fifth Amendment rights or the Tenth Amendment or whatever. And so if it's our supposed to be founding constitutional document, and I would disagree with that, but let's let's say that I've lost that argument, then you still need us all to agree if you're going to amend that or even agree with what it does say. Mm. Um, so I think we need to... We need to deal with how we... And because we've got seriously activist judges in some respects at the moment too... Yes. Um. We need to agree what it means. So it'd be better to write it down now, what we think it means, and let's 
Yeah, everyone agreeing, everybody voting on it. Not just Maori, because it isn't something that just affects Maori. And in fact, and arguably, it more affects the rest of us. Um, no, I don't disagree with what you have to say. And I'm, I'm glad you've raised this issue, Hilary, because um, David Seymour, the ACT Party leader, um, has announced that he wants to have a referendum, in actual fact, on the Treaty of Waitangi and on what the principles would be. But he's first of all yeah. got to define what those principles are. I've also yeah. noticed Christopher Luxon, who isn't as smart, certainly not as smart politically as Seymour, arguing, no, we don't need to do that. We are not, and that's the National Party saying, we don't need yeah. to worry about what the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi are. He doesn't want to entertain discussion on that. And I've also noticed in dealing with National Party people on this show that they've run away from this issue. And they've obviously been instructed to do so uh, by yeah. whoever's running their campaign. Well, so, at the moment, there's no point um, politically them starting a war with people who are uh, heading down the Liberal It's Only Fair brigade. Like I'm told now, for example, that if you went to something that had Maori at it too, and they started off by saying, this is my whakapapa, these are my mountains, these are my hills, whatever it is, Man, then it would be your job to say, I am in New Zealand by right, by virtue of the treaty, namely, that's I don't correct. have the rights that those that is, people over there have. That's correct. Yep. Now that's sort of, I'm not prepared. I don't agree with that. Well, no, what Tamahiri oh, sure. is saying, what Tamahiri is saying is the only way that non-Maori are in this country, particularly Pākehā, is by the consent of Maori. Okay? Yes. So and that's, that's his interpretation of the treaty. Discussion. Yeah. Yeah. And so Chris Luxon can say, let's not talk about it because during an election campaign wouldn't be the thing. Um, and I'm not sure I would write at the moment, unless I was the ACT Party, because they can. Um, but we do need to actually get to the bottom of this before it gets more silly and more silly. Well, this is how serious you know, we... and silly it, it is at the moment, Hillary, because most people don't understand this. Remember, I, I, in this apropos of our last discussion, I talked about how schools and education in, in t particular builds a bridge, uh, uh, no, a wall, uh, uh, a castle around schools so that parents can't get in and neither can anybody else and then creates its own rules within those schools and within the education bureaucracy in general. Um, on the treaty issues, they are now, this is the Ministry of Education are now instructing and have sent out material to every school, every school in New Zealand, all 2,800 of them, saying that they actually have to institute Treaty of Waitangi principles in each of those schools. And then they send... And if we don't know what they mean... At, well, no, they've... Yep. helpfully sent out what those treaty principles are in a documentation uh, called, um, uh, this is the New Zealand curriculum update from January of love last year. They've sent called out radical reform, hide it under the carpet please. Yep, a and they've actually said the principles of the treaty are partnership protection and participation. Now I'm sorry, but none of those things are in the court's judgment. Where did they get those principles from? Well, I've actually read this. Sure, uh, sorry, um, Hillary. Do you know where they got them from? I'll read it to What's you. It? I'll read it yeah. to you. As they find, this is direct instruction to 2,800 schools from the treaty, uh, from um, the Ministry of Education, published in January 2012. No mainstream media have reported this at all. But I'll read it to you now. This is the curriculum update and guide to all the schools from the Ministry of Education to those schools. As you work to enact the Treaty of Waitangi, schools may find it helpful to consider the three broad principles of partnership, protection and participation as suggested by the 1988 Royal Commission on Social Policy. These treaty principles have been used to structure this curriculum update. Yeah, well, it's the... Now, um, the you know and I know that the Royal Commission on Social Policy, which ended up in three volumes, ended up as a doorstop around Parliament and most public places around, 
has received no legal sanction at all and was not enacted by Parliament at all. In fact, it was actually studiously ignored by the then Labor government when it came out. The Ministry of yeah. Education have picked up something that has no legal status, hasn't even been discussed in a select committee in Parliament, taken its interpretation out of there and said, right, now every school in New Zealand will enact those treaty principles. Yeah. Well, the Ministry for Culture and Heritage said, oh, their website says, as a broad statement of principles on which the British and Maori made a political compact to found a nation state and build a government in New Zealand, and it goes on to say, different understandings of the treaty have long been the subject of debate. True enough. And that the exclusive right to determine the meaning of the treaty rests with the Waitangi Tribunal. Oh, for Pete's sake. Which has no legal That's status at all, except bullshit. as a recommendatory force. There is an act the White, for the Waitangi Tribunal, nowhere in that it suggests that they've got to be exclusive right, and they could not have the exclusive right to determine what is in a treaty No, between possibly two lots of people, or I don't and, know what it is. What and it, so this is the revolution, the constitutional yeah. revolution, that has been imposed upon us over the last three years by civil servants living in Wellington, drawing yeah. their sources from other than Parliament and other than the courts. Yes, and so back to the question you asked in the first place, or posed in the first place, um, is it as depressing as it seems that we can't make change? Yeah. Turns out that sort of change <coughs> can be made and we don't have to follow it along. We can try and unmake that change and it'll make a huge difference if we do because we're turning out with instead of one nation, which was the point of getting together in a country in harmony in the first place, um, we've ended up with at least two and a serious lot of argument and argy-bargy when we should be talking about it. Mm. Do we... Uh, sorry, uh, the thing that you know, we were discussing this at the moment is do we trust National <laughs> to undo this stuff, given that Luxon is studiously seeking to avoid it? Um, I think if you've got to choose which are more likely to, I think he's going to be stuck with undoing at least the water crap. Yeah. And once he starts looking at that, he might get a taste for it. And I think when he talks to people after the election, because at the moment, really, you can see why they don't want to. I mean, I've walked around Parliament saying really controversial things like, I think laws should apply to everybody. And people would say, racist, bitch. You know? <laughs> um, and you don't... I think there's a lot of people in New Zealand who would like to get rid of all that crap. They just can't put their heads up. And I think even the people who work in government departments and things and are told to do that, they don't like it. A lot of ordinary Maori don't seem to care for it because it doesn't doing them any good. Mm. And a lot of non-Maori are just annoyed that it seems to be against them, even when it isn't. Mm. I mean, so I've got some confidence that with the right help and encouragement and people like you making a difference by talking about it, I think it will happen. I've just been reading recently um, an economics magazine and I thought it was interesting because it was saying that we, that this is just a sort of segue out of here, um, that the West and the authoritarian regimes, if you can call those on off either side of the track, it looks like some of the authoritarian regimes might be winning with their arguments and things. And this is an argument against that. And it says prosperity is built on the rule of law. Wealthy countries have more resources to spend on dealing with disasters, likewise confident in their savings and the social safety net. The citizens of rich countries know that they are less vulnerable to the chance events that wreck lives elsewhere. But the, it finishes by saying the deepest solution to insecurity, because it says when people are insecure, they are happy to be pushed around, like we were with COVID and things when people were feeling insecure, people were a bit more happy to be pushed around. 
the deep, deepest solution to insecurity lies in how countries cope with change, whether it's global warming, artificial intelligence, or the growing tensions between China and America. The countries that manage change well, which should cheer you up, will be better at making society feel confident in the future. That is where universal values come into their own. Tolerance, free expression, and individual inquiry help harness change through consensus forged by reason, debate, and reform. There is no better way to bring about progress. Yes, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't want to debate this with you. I mean, uh, this is, well, I, 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 what I'm just thinking of... I'm just throwing it out there. No, it's fair enough, a, but yeah. I, I wonder, I look at China and it's inexorable rise over the last 20, 30 years, Hillary, not a democracy, not a rule of law country. Yeah. Um, no. Never had a democracy. There, there isn't one aspect of China that's ever been democratic and it's, what, 1,000, 1,500-year history? Ste yes, and now it's struggling. Mm, it's, um, it's having a temporary struggle. It's having a recession. No, it's well, not we've had temporary them in the West. because it's got no children anymore. Well, there's, there's 1.3 billion of them. Do they need no children? children? Yeah, they do because it's been 30 years now that they've had not... And they overstated their population. They got it wrong by 178 million. And they were all the young people, apparently, that they thought they had that they didn't have. But in the end, they, autocratic regimes, bring about change through bloody revolution, really. When people get enough pissed off at their standard of living, it's worked. Because the standard of living's increased, it's worked all right, so they've been all right. You know, so long as progress is happening and everything. But... And we change our regimes through more bloodless things, but not in a, in a big fashion. But in the end, you have to listen to the people, either because you're going to get your head chopped off if you don't sooner or later in an autocratic regime, or because of the voters, which is why, taking us back to the earlier part of the conversation, why our people lie to us, because what they have to do to get power is to tell us they're going to be a better option. What China has to do is be a better option. So I think they're more realistic. You know, if they're building a bridge or they're doing something, they actually want to know whether it's going to work in the outcome because it's the outcome that'll stop them getting their head chopped off. In our society, it's the lies you tell that makes people choose you. Mm, I, I, I'm not so sure I agree with you. I think Western civilization's lost its way. And I think it's lost its way because instead of having the old-fashioned Victorian values of hard work, enterprise, reward for initiative, and, hard, and, and you know, and being a generally decent person, um, those values have been lost. And if uh, not totally, I, I think they I think they're there underneath. Your kids have got them. My kids have got them. Mm -hmm. But people out there understand but we're living in a, under a government at the moment or at least under a public service regime where because my children are successful they are regarded as either you know the sons and daughters of captain cook and therefore have an original sin staining them for their activities of their ancestors or alternatively are required to pay taxation at such a rate to cater for hundreds of thousands of people who don't want to work um, at all. I think I, I'm more optimistic about it than you. I think well, those things are underlying. You hear um, Americans still, and I'm not saying America is a poster child country, but Americans, if you have choosing 30 people for a pre-team and then choose 15 of them for the actual team, namely you reject 15 of them, those 15 will say, thank you for the opportunity. That's mm. the standard thing for an American to say, thank you for the opportunity. And that's what their program to do. And I think our, our programming is underlying there 
even the people who work, the reason we know some government departments are completely stuffed is because people who work for them are prepared to go to the media and say, look, we've been t told not to follow these like um, immigration checks and things. We've been told not to do them because they know that they should be doing them. They know that that's the right thing and they've been told not to. And I think if you walked in there and said, okay, game's up, let's actually do our job properly, most of the people in the room would say, good idea. And the ones who don't are excess and you don't need to have them tomorrow morning anyway. Mm. So what you're essentially saying is that we've got checks and balances, whether they are the media, whether they are um, whistleblowers, um, and you can provide examples. You've given the immigration one, I guess the police one, with the foiling the... Um, the electronic um, monitoring devices, which has been, obviously somebody's leaked that out of the police to show how ridiculous our policy is at the moment. You've got people like that who are prepared to do the right thing. Yeah. Is that right? And civil defence in Hawke's Bay, which is just coming out. Wow. What a disaster that Goodness was. Thing. Thing. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. and days and reports to civil defence over 36 hours or something saying, this is looking bad. Yeah. Here's where we think it's going to flood. Yeah. Those houses there might be going to go. Yeah. Really, it's going to go, and presumably they just went home overnight at five o'clock and didn't do anything till half past five the next morning. Well, their de civil defence controller was on a holiday in the South Island, wasn't he? Unable to be contacted. <sighs> Remember that? Anyway, the fact that we know that these things are going. Yes, I wrong, guess that's right. No, I wouldn't know that good. necessarily in China, would I? I just know that yeah. six months later, somebody was taken outside and shot. Yes. Yes. No, it's fair enough. There's probably an intermediate... Or your plane's been blown up. Yes, that's the other option. Hello, we're not flying anymore. Mm. Yeah, I uh, did like the comment made by somebody recently about the Russian people, and he says bad things ha happen to them. Um, they get poisoned and things a lot, and sometimes more kinetic options. <laughs> Oh, no, there's, there's part of me that just uh, does admire the directness of totalitarian regimes, though. I do like that. I do think that they are required in Kilburnie, for example, this morning, when Rosemary Penwarden and some of her Dunedin mates tried to shut down Wellington City again and commuter transport in general. Those yes, do, well... Does, and Dunedin is a bit yeah. of a citadel, isn't it, for eco sort of petty terrorists? I mean, there are a lot of them around. Yes, and what's a bit more depressing about that is that although there's a lot of them around, and I do like a bit of anarchy myself, um, it's on average there's quite some clever people and some brains being used down here, but they're not being used for anything clever. Yes, you know, well. they're mm. sort of stupid, but yes. stupid people are from whence comes alternatives, I suppose. Hilary, thank you. As always, you have an insightful take on the world. Um, we disagree so many times, but as you're probably right, most of them. Thank you so much. See you next Tuesday.